Welcome to track three. Uh, and we have uh, Frank Wills. He's going to be speaking about uh, putting Python in Postgres. Thanks, everybody. Star Trek, VI, Emacs. But in this case, we actually get to combine them. So we get to do some practical things and maybe even some silly things like, you know, what it'd be like to hear Chewbacca get beamed up. Why on earth would you want to do this stuff? Most of the time, for performance reasons, if you want to do triggers and stored procedures in Postgres, you really want to try and do them with PLPG SQL, especially if it's something that's going to be hit very, very often in very, very high use environments. But a lot of times, beating your head against PLPG SQL to get it to do what you want is just kind of a pain. Um, I kind of think about it like Bash. At a certain point, I just want to go write a script. I don't want to have to try and figure out how Bash wants me to do it. You can also take advantage of things like PyP packages, network connections, things that you can't do with PLPG SQL. Um, one of the best use cases is to retrofit large systems where you either don't have access to the code because it's proprietary, or you don't want to touch the code because it's fragile, or it's in a language you don't know. Um, those are really great use cases for what I'm going to talk about today. So let's get started. Installing PLPython isn't the simplest thing in the world. Um, it kind of varies by system, but most modern Unix Linux systems, it's pretty painless aptitude to install. The package, uh, Homebrew, um, I just tried to do last night and had quite a bit of trouble with. Um, it will install it, but it keeps wanting to use the system Python, even when it tells you that if you do Python equals path to your Python, that it will use that particular Python. So I ended up having to do some uh, path munging in my, in my actual stored procedures. You may, you may also have trouble with that. If you compile it by hand, though, it will act, do the right thing. Setting it up for a database in Postgres, you define which databases have access to which languages. This is just kind of an admin construct to make sure that you know, the DBA or the systems administrator has said, yes, you can use this language in this particular database and maybe not this language in this other uh, for keeping permissions separate. So you create your database with create DB and then you add the language that you've already installed with create lang to a particular database. You can also put those in template databases. So if you create lots of databases, you can add the two or three languages you want to use in a template and then create new databases off of that template. Um, you can double check that you've done it correctly with uh, this little SQL here, select star from PG language. If you don't see PL Python listed there, you have not done it correctly. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that in the Postgres world, Python is an untrusted language. Um, Python doesn't really have a good way of sandboxing itself. Um, so like if you were to use PL Perl, you can use PL Perl or PL Perl, Perl U for whether it's trusted or untrusted. What that means in Postgres is an untrusted language can do whatever it wants. It can write to the file system, it can blow away files, it runs as the Postgres user, whatever your database is running as. It can make network connections, it can do pretty much whatever it wants, including destroy the database that it's running in. Um, so it's not something you want to give to random users, um, but like I said, certain languages do have a, a safety kind of sandbox system like Perl where you can say you can use the internal language constructs, but you can't touch the file system, you can't talk to the network. Uh, unfortunately, Python doesn't have that. So let's start by writing our first function. This is a very simple and really silly function to use. Um, you would be, be much better off performance-wise and sanity-wise to just use multiplication in SQL itself, but this illustrates how you go about creating a function. Um, you can do create or replace, which is one of the few places in Postgres where you actually can do create or replace. Uh, most of the time you can't do that with tables and indexes and things, but with functions you can. Um, you define a name, then the arguments it takes. You define those arguments in terms of SQL. So this is an integer. It'll take an int4, int2, int8. Um, you can also use var car text. Um, so you, you don't use Python uh, data types there. And then you say what it returns, if anything. It can return nothing. 
uh, which would be void in, post, in Postgres lingo. You don't use a null, uh, which confuses some people. Um, and then you use this weird double dollar quoting, and that avoids having to do any weird quoting of your actual source. You can put whatever string you want in between those quotes. So some people put dollar body dollar. Um, if for some reason the language you're writing in um, sees dollar dollar as something special. Um, the reason for this is there's lots of different, there's probably about 15 or 20 different languages Postgres can use for stored procedures all the way from you know, R to LOL code and crazy stuff like that. But so this highlights in blue the SQL parts of this and the red is the little bit of Python we're actually using here. Using PLPython, it will coerce your data types for you for the most part and in pretty sane ways. Um, small ints and ints become ints, big ints become longs, booleans become bools, all the different text types become strings, um, SQL arrays become lists. This also works coming outside of the function, so if you return a list, it will return a SQL array. Um, if you define custom types, which I don't go into, uh, into in this talk, but are pretty easy. You can define a type like you would a table, and so it can have several constituent parts. So if you are passing in a type or returning a type, um, it will rep be represented as a dictionary. Um, in Python 3, it does the right things also. Um, it's one of the few things I've run across that's really ready for Python 3. Um, small ints and ints and big ints all are just ints in Python 3, and strings are all come in and out as Unicode as they should. One of the hardest things about working with stored procedures is debugging them. Um, using a print statement really doesn't work. You, you can do it, but only if you're in the terminal where you started the Postgres server itself. So that's not very convenient unless you're doing local debugging. Um, with this special PLPy namespace that is included in all of your stored procedures, you can access Postgres's log directly. So you can put out notice messages, debug messages, errors and fatals. Um, errors and fatals will actually stop the transaction. So you can't, it's not just like syslog where it's just a, I'd like to categorize these. They actually do have side effects. Um, if you don't like using that, you can use plain old Python logging because you can do whatever you want in an untrusted language. But you have to put this in all of your stored procedures or abstract this off in your own modules and it starts to become a little cumbersome and, and verbose. There's lots of problems to using this. Um, I think this is a neat topic. This is one of those things you should have in your toolbox. But uh, it's kind of a pain to use. Uh, it, it should be used sparingly. I don't think it's a good idea to necessarily push all of your logic down into the database. Um, you know, you, you, you run into lots of problems keeping things in sync and keeping people uh, on the same page you know, that, that you just don't have in the same ways when you're, when you're doing it in, at the app level. Um, if your DBA isn't aware that this is going on for whatever reason or doesn't remember that he installed that language once, you can really confuse them because they're not necessarily looking for triggers that are attached to tables. Um, they should be, but a lot of times they overlook that. And I've done it too. I've put a trigger on a table and like, why is this weird side effect happening? And I've forgotten I've added that a year and a half ago. It doesn't really jump out at you that that's going on. Um, they're, they're not exactly slow, but they're definitely not free. Um, there are some ways you can speed them up if the, if the functions are immutable, something like, um, something like the multiplication example I gave, given the same arguments, it always returns the same values. Those can be cached and become pretty quick, but most of the things you're going to want to use this for are not something that you can really make immutable. So they, they end up being slower than doing them in PLPG SQL. Um, to install these, uh, to create functions, you have to be a super user um, and you have to uh, realize that, at least to my knowledge, there's no way to use a virtual env. Um, so this, the, any packages you need get installed system-wide. So with all the dangers aside, when should you use it? Um, one of the best use cases is when you're rolling up and aggregating data. Um, I worked for a cable company and we took um, 
every 15 minutes grabbed SNMP data off every cable modem in the system to calculate a bandwidth by user. And then we would roll that up into hourly, daily, weekly, monthly stats. We were doing that with a Perl cron job that was on one system, talked to the database over the network. Well, you're pulling back millions of rows and adding up integers and then pushing back tens of thousands of rows of the rolled up data. It took about 10 minutes, 12 minutes to run, and we were running it every 15 minutes, so we were very quickly getting to that window where it was going to start stepping on itself, and we converted it to a stored procedure. Uh, granted, it was PL Perl, not PL Python, but that cut it down to 50 some seconds just because of removing all of the network round trips and the SQL parsing that was happening going back and forth. So that's a really great way to, to use this. Um, another great spot is when you need to enforce constraints that aren't typical SQL level constraints. Um, you know, not that this must be an integer or this must be a string or this must be of a certain size. If you want to have like, I want to make sure that this value in this column matches some other column matches some reference to a REST service or an email that you know, is in an email field passes some complex regular expression that you want to validate against. You can put that in at the, at the database level, and then it doesn't matter if somebody's doing ad hoc queries. It doesn't matter if you've got a Rails app and a Django app and some Perl code all talking in the same database. You can be certain that that data is going to be clean across all of them, no matter who screws up. You can also use this to retrofit proprietary systems. Um, so you know, a lot of times you don't have access to the code or you don't want to be able to get in, you don't want to go in there and touch it. Maybe somebody doesn't want you to. Um, I, I've had a couple of situations where they just plain didn't have access to the code. It was something a, a consultant had written for them and for whatever reason they never bothered to ask for the code and then the guy was no longer anywhere to be found. So they only had a Java compiled version of it and it was crucial to their business and they couldn't turn it off but they needed to kind of live with it for another six months until they could rebuild something else but they needed to start getting some alerts when certain things happened in certain tables. So we were able to drop in some stored procedures there, fire off emails, maybe count up some metrics and things that they needed to see underneath the app and the app didn't need to know that that was even happening. So triggers. Triggers are how you do most of this. Um, while you can use just plain old stored procedures to do things like multiplication or more simple operations on data itself, where the real fun happens is when you start to use triggers. So let's say we've got this set up. We've got a simple table, um, you know, an ATM balance kind of example here. You've got a username, whether or not the person's active, and what their balance is. And I go ahead and create me, Jacob, and Jeff. Uh, Jeff and I are both active and have a balance, but Jacob's not active. But, you know, he does have a balance. So let's make it so that you can't update the balance of somebody who's inactive. So we create this function. We create our own Python exception, just like you would in Python. And then we just check if the, this, uh, sorry, I should explain. The, the, this TD variable here is something that's passed in and on all triggers. And it gives you several different pieces of data, depending upon what's going on. Um, I'll show you all the different pieces that it gives you here in another slide. But this is asking for, in the old version of the row, is, if, if is active is not true, raise that exception. So basically double checking that this person is really active before we, we allow anything to happen. You attach this, oh sorry, and this is the example um, of how to handle the update case. So that would be the insert case, and this is the update case. So if you were updating a, a row and setting them to active and setting their balance at the same, in the same SQL statement, you'd want that to go through because they're becoming active and you're changing, their, you're changing their balance. So this checks to see that if it wasn't active before and it's not active now, also raise the exception. You hook this to a table with this bit of SQL. So you create trigger, you give it some name, I called it double check active. And you say either before or after some operation, insert, update, delete, on a table. You can say for each row or for each statement, so it doesn't have to necessarily be on a row by row basis, execute the procedure, check active. 
So what happens when you try and do this? If you run that SQL statement on poor old user Jacob, you actually get the Python exception that you would, would expect. So this TD variable gives us several different things. It gives us an event, events whether or not what SQL operation is happening, um, when, when the trigger was being fired. So this is useful if you want to write triggers that you then maybe apply in different ways to different tables. So perhaps in certain tables you want this to apply before the statement is executed. Sometimes maybe you want it to do after. And another cool feature is you can say, do this instead of that SQL statement. So don't run that SQL statement at all, but instead do whatever's in my stored procedure. And then at what level it's running, whether or not it's the row, or the statement, um, and then new and old copies of the row, which is how you determine what's happening. Um, then the name of the trigger itself, the name of the table, again, if you're writing triggers that are reused across multiple tables, you're going to need to know which table is being worked on, which schema it's in, and then you can also pass arguments to triggers. Um, so, if, again, if you're writing reusable trigger functions, you could say, you know, where, you know, uh, check my active column where column is this column name, because maybe your active column is, in, is active in certain tables and it's just active in others and maybe it's called foo in other ones for whatever reason. So you can pass in which column you're maybe particularly interested in looking at. So here's all the different options for the create trigger that shows before and after which events. You can chain events together with or, so you can say, you know, create this trigger before inserts or updates or deletes. Uh, maybe, you, maybe the case is you only want this to run on updates and truncates for whatever reason, whatever your business logic is, you can set that and just use one SQL statement. Um, you can also do a little more complex things as individual functions, like this checks and makes sure that your credit card passes the, the simple credit card checksum test and returns just true or false. You could use that in your SQL. Um, this is absolutely something you could do in PLPG SQL, but not as readable and as easy to do as you would in Python. I mean, it's, you could, it could be done. I'm sure it can be done. I just don't want to have to write it. I don't think most people want to have to write it. Um, so let's do something a little bit more interesting. Um, since we can use network connections, we're going we're gonna to use some real counters that we might want to use in a, in a real production system. So we've got a typical messaging system with two users, from users, whether or not this message has been read and what the message is. So um, these next three functions um, really could be and should be done as one function, but to do them as one function I found makes the font so small you're not going to be able to read it. So I broke it up into individual ones for the insert case, the update case, and, and the delete case. So here's the insert case. Um, we're grabbing the two user, creating a key, creating a connection to our local Redis. I didn't pass in any host information, but it could be a remote system. And I increment their unread count key right from the database level. Then you can have an update case. So we can see if it used to be not read and is now read, decrement their count. Otherwise, if they would mark the message as unread again, you need to handle that case too. So this would then increment if, the, if it went the other direction. You can also then just do a simple decrement on deletes. And then here would be the three SQL statements to attach that to those tables. And it uses, again, you have to use specific names. So to create the trigger, it has to be a unique name. It can't be the same name as the table or an index or <clears throat> anything like that in Postgres. Everything has to have its own name. So sometimes you might come up with a naming convention. I usually end them with underscore trigger just so that I can see triggers from indexes, from tables. Um, but that doesn't fit well on the slides, so I left it out. So what other kind of things can you do? One of the things that people use this a lot for is um, act, executing other SQL when something help, happens in the table. This is useful for building materialized views. Um, so here's how you do that. Again, that special PLPy namespace that gets brought in gives us executes and prepares 
so that we can do typical database level access. So we can say, you know, this is a ticket system. Um, we can, um, oh, I have that named as count, but that shouldn't really be db count. That's a bad function name. Um, if the row coming in is now set to false, go ahead and add its ID to a table finished tickets. Um, that's a very simple example because, again, it's very hard to get complex examples to fit on the screen, and this even kind of breaks some formatting. Um, this won't cut and paste directly into Postgres without some issues. Uh, but uh, you can also then use, instead of using Python string formatting there, you can use plpy.prepare, which works like you would expect. It prepares a plan and has placeholder values and prevents SQL injections and those kinds of things. Uh, but th this, this fits better on the screen, sadly. So as I mentioned with uh, internal ideas, um, we, uh, we use it a lot, uh, or we see it used a lot with aggregating and rolling up data. Anything that is going to be very noisy going back and forth between your app servers or where, you know, Celery workers or wherever your code is running and the database. Anything that has lots of data flowing back and forth is a good place to maybe try and use this. Uh, if it's pulling lots of data and doing some calculations and pushing it back, that's a really great place to think about. Maybe this is a spot to do it. Um, again, building and maintaining materialized views is one of the best use cases for it. Um, you don't end up doing those round trips in your own code to say, okay, I'm inserting over here, and then it's not really a materialized view at that point. You're really just kind of executing multiple SQL statements. So a, you know, a materialized view should really be something that happens automatically behind the scenes to the app. So using these kinds of triggers uh, is how you, how you accomplish that. Um, another spot you can do is if you have any kind of reporting going on that maybe is stored in the database uh, for whatever reason, you can only kick off those report generations when enough of the data has changed that maybe you care. Maybe you only want to re regenerate a report when 25% of the data has changed, or it's you know, so, some kind of weird business case where it only matters to you in those kinds of situations. You can detect that stuff with these triggers. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is that on the trigger um, SQL, you can have a condition to it, so you can say, only execute this when these following SQL uh, where conditions are true. So if the row is coming in and it doesn't touch the columns you're interested in, you can have it not run the query at all uh, and only run it if, it's, if certain, if certain uh, columns meet certain conditions. So that can cut down on how often it gets fired unnecessarily. So some ideas on how to use this externally outside the database. Um, emails. Email alerts are probably one of the, the most frequent times I use this. I, I just want to know when a row gets inserted into the database that has this value. I want to know when, you know, this temp table is created or when this many rows are in this table, whatever the condition is. I want to get an email or I want to send my boss an email, um, <laughs> something like that. You can also use it. Um, to expire and repopulate caches, so something like memcached. If you're caching a lot of data and you don't want to have to handle that in your app code, or maybe you can't because you're spanning multiple systems, you've got some Node and some Python and some PHP all going on in the same database, you know, maybe you can't reliably expire across in, inside of Python in your Python apps, but you can then at, at the database layer. You could fire off celery tasks to do something entirely database unrelated or related. Um, you could trigger backups based on how much of the data has changed, kind of like the reporting system. Maybe I, maybe I don't want to do a daily backup because it's expensive and it takes up a lot of disk space. Maybe I only want to do it if more than 1% of my data has changed. If there's some way for you to calculate that, maybe you only kick off a database backup at those particular points. Um, you can also then hit any kind of API, any kind of network connection you can think of, anything you would normally do in Python code, you can then do straight from the database, but only have it happen in certain conditions if you want it, or it can happen always. Um, I tried to come up with a really good example with zero MQ, because I think that would be really neat to try and do something. But again, that's a lot of code, and it doesn't really fit on a slide. Um, 
I could definitely see some kind of poor man's replication with some uh, stored procedures and some pub sub. Uh, I don't think I'd necessarily recommend it, but it could be interesting. Um, <laughs> Again, um, in retrofitting existing systems, uh, email alerts, you can, one way I've seen this used a lot is to populate another system, be it via REST interface, um, with inserts into my system. So I only have a REST interface to maybe a MailChimp API or something like that. Uh, most of the time you'd probably do that in code, but there may be situations where you want to use that from something that happens in the database to populate that externally. Um, maybe you don't want to dive into tracks code, but your boss wants, a, wants an SMS whenever a ticket, the priority one is created. You know, maybe you don't want to have to worry about making changes to the code, even when you have access to the code, because you don't want to have upgrade problems. You, know, you don't want to have to re-implement that patch every time track moves forward or whatever you're working with. This way you can do it underneath the app, and the app never has to really care. And apparently I have gone through this a little quicker than I thought I would. So any questions? There's, there's two microphones here, so if you want to ask a question, please use one of the two microphones. So is there a good way to limit the runtime of a PL Python procedure so it's not hanging on the network or gets caught in a loop or something? You know, I don't think there is. I don't think there's any way to say that there's a timeout on the, you know, only run this for a certain amount of time. I don't think that at the SQL layer you can do that. I mean, you could put timeouts into your own code. Um, so like, you know, your lib or whatever you're using, you could make sure that it doesn't take very long. But uh, no, I don't think there's any way to, to do that. I mean, that's one of the kind of the performance problems that you run into. Is right. it, can you? If you, put, if you put a statement timeout on the query that called the trigger, that'll affect the trigger. That, okay, so, okay. And that'll, and that'll just trigger a rollback on, on that transaction, I guess? Yeah, it, it'll cancel the entire statement um, if it was part of a larger transaction, transaction too. Cool. Uh, have you found a good way to test the Python code that you toss into the um, stored procedure? The, the best way I've found to test is to fake it outside the stored procedure and not, not actually do it inside of Postgres. And so create your own TD objects with the values you expect and run tests over that and then load them in. Um, there, there really isn't a, a better way. I, I, I'm, I'm a, I would imagine you could probably somehow shoehorn like PDB in there somehow, but I've never managed to make it work. <laughs> You mentioned um, deterministic functions being cacheable. Does that happen by itself? Do you have to no, no, you have to set uh, in the SQL statement where you attach it to a table, okay. you say is immutable. Okay. How easy is it to specify an arbitrary Python binary? Because that might be a solution to the virtual end thing. Like um, it's, it's, you can't do it uh, like per database or anything like that, but you can do it per Postgres cluster. So, so when, you, when you install Postgres or compile it, um, you can say, use this Python here. OK, so you can only have one per DB then. One one, per yeah, one per cluster. But you could run multiple Postmasters on the same system on different ports if you really wanted to have them on the same hardware. Uh, but yeah, it does get kind of messy. If you can uh, run Postgres queries inside of a trigger of a Postgres query, can you effectively get yourself into a, ser a situation of Postgresception? Basically. Yeah, I mean, you could create an infinite loop, but that'll eventually time out. That, okay. That'll eventually time out. Is there a way that you can run a query and, and explicitly specify, I know there are triggers on this query, don't run them, because I'm running it from a trigger? Not yet. No. Okay. That's going to be featured in Postgres 9 too, but you can't do it yet. Okay. Is the uh, Python interpreter external or baked into Postgres in this situation? It's embedded. embedded. So if a statement from the client code doesn't have a timeout, is there any way to go to Postgres and kill the trigger that gets in trouble or the hangs for some reason? Like for example, I saw you using a uh, connection to Redis. And mm -hmm. you know, where I work, we have some triggers and store procedures that are not written in, inside Postgres, but sometimes they get in trouble because they have to connect to external services and something happens. And, 
Yeah, um, yeah like, like Josh said, you can put a you can put a, a, a statement timeout on that particular statement that calls the trigger uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. But you can't do it really as the trigger itself. But you could, in the case of Redis, have a connection timeout in your code. I mean, but if you've already deployed that and you have a timeout problem, you can figure out which Postgres backend processes are running it and kill those individually if you really had to. Oh, okay, that's what I meant. So you have to go to the server and locate the, the process and kill that. Okay. Yeah, if, if, it's already been, if it's already out there and, and, and it's hung. I see, okay. Hi, two questions. Um, first, I've used PL Python a lot and it's great for those side tasks, the email mm -hmm. um, triggers and stuff. I found doing um, l intensive database work inside it to be painfully slow um, to the point where the difference between doing it in Python and um, PL PGSQL was, you know, magnitude of 10. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that, just, that, that, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, um, one of the uh, ways that I first got into starting to use triggers is uh, to automatically update a modified timestamp on rows whenever somebody does an update. And at first I did that with Perl and that slowed things down really, really slow. And I would imagine it would be very similar in Python. But yeah, doing something like that in PLPG SQL is lightning com in, in comparison. But at a certain point, you know, you're, you're kind of trading programmer efficiency for, for time there. And so if it's something that you don't have to do as often, if you're doing something internally, a back office system that maybe only gets kicked off once a day, the slowness doesn't matter. The ability to just get it done uh, is much more important. Yeah. I, I didn't do any of my own testing, but I suspected a lot of the, the um, loss in performance is mapping the types back and forth between, be, between the Postgres internals and the Python mm -hmm. space. So if you're doing yeah. operating on a row by row inside a stored, per, you know, inside your procedure, it gets, you know, it, it's painful. Yeah, I would imagine that's what, well, part of it. Yes. So related to that was I um, one, one thing that stopped me using PL um, Python in one project was um, dates were returned as strings. Um, and not using date time. And then I looked a little bit more and I realized that it was not using, um, you don't use the DB API, the Python DB API from within uh, PL Python, which I find a bit ironic. Do you know if, if there's any there work on is. Um, is there I, work I came on? across it when I was researching this and I don't remember the name of it. It's, I think it's like PL Python DB API. It, there's, a, there's a pipey package. That, lets, that gives you that interface inside of a PL Python. Okay, thank you. But I, on the daytime, you know, I didn't work with any dates. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if I was doing in, some work on time Josh, series. Josh, do you know if if in if in nine or nine one, if if it returns daytime objects? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I didn't try any dates. Yeah. I I would bet it's probably still strings, but I don't know. Do you know if the Python interpreter works with any alternative interpreters, such as Jython or PyPy or something like that? No, I don't think it does. Okay. Not, not for PL Python, no. Right. Yep. right. I'd say actually not yet, but um, a new procedural language is one of the ways that people get started hacking Postgres, so you're always welcome to try. Um, one of the things I was also going to suggest to you is one other thing that you can do with PL Python that you can't do with PLPG SQL is actually fake uh, what's known as an autonomous transaction. One of the problems is that when you call a procedure in Postgres, that procedure is necessarily its own transaction. And that can be a problem if what you wanted to run in that procedure requires you to have a transaction that might say potentially abort um, or um, needs to run as a separate transaction as certain maintenance statements do. So you can actually, in the PL Python store procedure, you can actually call out to PsychoPG and have PsychoPG reconnect to the same database and run a statement in a different transaction space than the calling stored procedure. Um, uh, you know, it's a workaround for a feature that we will eventually have in Postgres, but but don't have now. But it's it it comes in handy. I was curious if you've used uh, um, 
the table function uh, capability for py uh, PL Python functions, because that's one of the things that I find most convenient is that you can take a uh, Python procedure and essentially turn it into, or its results, uh, into something that looks like a table, and then subsequently you can actually start to do standard SQL stuff on top of that. So you, you've got all your joins, filters, and so on. Um, yeah, I haven't really done much with that. I mean, most of the time that I'm doing anything along those lines, it's, I, I've, or I push all the way down to a materialized view, so it's actually real tables. But, uh, but I can see how that, that could be useful. Uh, might be a silly question, but uh, just to clarify, you only have to be a super user, you have super user privileges to create this, the stored procedures, not to actually call them. Not, not to call them, right, just to create them. Cool. Anything else? Do we have any more questions? <coughs> okay, so I want to thank Frank for a great talk and